You just had lucky stars looking over you, I guess. Just with well, I don't know how much down. luck is involved. It's been a hell of a lot of hard work, you know. A lot of people don't know. A, a lot of people just think, oh, well, I'd love to look at a record store. All you do is sit around and listen to music all day. That's not what you do. <laughs> Greetings, one and all, and welcome to Tom's Hit Parade. I'm really excited about this. I have a very special feature to share with you. It is my first interview, and I think it went pretty well, so this may be the first of many. Now, I've been talking about it pretty much since the first of the year. I've mentioned a few, a few times in various embryonic stages on my channel, and after three months of coordinating and planning and an entire afternoon of filming and six weekends or probably more of post-production, it's finally finished. The subject of my interview is Skip Hermans, the owner of Skip's Records and CD World in Eugene. It's a store I've talked about several times. It's where I get the mystery CD grab bags that I open every month in my bargain bag segment. And I also happen to be wearing uh, the Skip's t-shirt for the occasion, where the music still matters. And let me show you the back of the shirt. I hope I got that in frame for you. But yeah, and it's, it's also a pretty big store as record stores go. It is, I think, the largest store between Portland and San Francisco uh, along the I-5 corridor. Yes, if you happen to be traveling Interstate 5 through the Pacific Northwest and you're in the mood for a record store crawl, come to Skip's in Eugene. It's, it's a must stop. But anyway, uh, any other year, and I might not have done this, but uh, ever since I found out in January that this was going to be the 30th anniversary year of Skips, I thought, what better time? Uh, I really wanted to get this interview done and uploaded uh, before the store's actual anniversary date in March, but, well, Skip's a really busy guy. He's a tough guy to pin down. Uh, plus, the store's anniversary date being so soon before Record Store Day just made an interview impossible. Uh, his, his calendar was just so booked with Record Store Day, as he'll explain later in the interview. But finally, at the end of May, after things started quieting down, I was able to book an afternoon with him. Now, more than just being that Record Store guy, I'm proud and honored to call Skip a friend. Uh, he's so much fun to talk to. Uh, whenever I go into the store and he happens to be on the sales floor, which is usually two or three times a month, we just stand there end up chatting for 10 or 15 minutes about this and that. And especially in this case, he was just incredibly generous with his time. I mean, we spent more than two and a half hours chatting. I mean, he basically threw away an entire afternoon for me, which is unbelievably generous. And, uh, you know, when it was all said and done, pun intended, uh, I came home with more than two and a half hours of video, which took me a total of probably 24 hours, all counted together, uh, to edit and distill down to 60 minutes. Uh, now, I know it sounds like a lot, but it's spread over three videos, uh, each one running about 20 minutes. Now, the main interview is going to be in two parts, and if you haven't had enough of him by that point, and honestly, if you ask me, it's really hard to get bored listening to him, because uh, with over 40 years in the music business, uh, you can imagine the guy's got a whole bunch of knowledge and stories to share, as you will see over the course of this feature. There will be a third video packed with fun extra footage, uh, now, my only regret with uh, this video is that I couldn't put the camera in such a place where I could also be in the shot. So, in order to alleviate the visual monotony, uh, I decided to put in a whole bunch of pictures which I mined from uh, Skip's Records' official Facebook page. So anyway, in this first segment, Skip talks about the long road that ultimately led to him opening his own store, and about the extended family that the store has given him, not just amongst his employees and his customers, but also the community at large. So I invite you to sit back and enjoy part one of my interview with Skip. Now, I am here with Skip Hermans, the owner and proprietor of Skip's Records and CD World, quite possibly the uh, best record store in the Pacific Northwest, in my opinion, but then I'm biased. Anyway, Skip, it's good to have you here. I know you're a busy guy, and uh, thanks for taking the time out, too. Sure, no problem. Uh, so, yeah, you recently celebrated a real milestone, your 30th anniversary in business. Uh, I'll bet you never expected you'd be here after 30 years. I never really expected to be here after two or three. <laughs> 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 Why I'm still here 30 years later, uh, it, it baffles me. I started this business thinking that, you know, it might go somewhere, but we had no idea what it was. and. What's sort of weird is when we first started it, you know, it was called CD World because we only carried CDs. We were the first CD only store on the West Coast. And that um, was a real gamble. I mean, CDs were. It was a gamble, a and it years. wasn't, and there was a lot, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, inventory out there at the time. Yeah. You know, I mean, vinyl was still going away and cassettes were still going strong, but CDs were. 
an untested yeah. or an un we were forced into CDs by the record labels really? I mean they just stopped making vinyl period and it was a risk there's a long story how I started um, I don't know if you want me to tell you. That actually was going to be my next question. Is yeah. How did you get started in the record store business, and how did Skips come to be? Well, 73, 74, while I was going to high school, um, I went to high school in Albany, and there was a record store over in Corvallis called Everybody's Records. And a friend of mine and I used to drive over every Saturday morning and buy three albums, because you could buy three albums for $10. They were three ninety nine or three for $10. And I always bought three albums. I grew up in a family around music. Um, I'm one of eight brothers and sisters. Oh wow. <laughs> I'm in the middle. And I have three older brothers that were that were I was very influenced in my music taste by. Um, while well, all my friends were listening to Ted Nugent and Fog Hat and Journey and stuff, <laughs> I was listening to Roy Gallagher and Ten Years After and the more obscure artists. Very yeah. They weren't you know, they weren't too obscure for its time, but they weren't the they weren't the pop hits. They weren't the top hits, you know. And um, after numerous trips over to this re everybody's records, they were going to open a store in Albany, and they said, "Do you want a job? You hang out here all the time. You know everybody <laughs> that works here." And blah blah blah. And I said, "Yeah, I'd love to have a chance at it." One thing led to another. I went to work in the Corvallis store for about six months, and then we opened the Albany store, and I took over running that. At the time. Everybody's Records was owned by a, a gentleman named Tom Keenan out of Portland and he had like nine stores or eight stores throughout Oregon and Washington mm -hmm. and um, they grew and grew and he was one of the very first people to ever have video rentals Oh wow! and he got into the video business pretty big and hard and it sort of uh, hurt his bottom line because um, it was a relatively new business and it was expensive he got in a little financial trouble, so on and so forth. Guy out of Eugene here named Norm Anderson um, bought the Corvallis, the Eugene, and the Albany store from Tom. Tom either closed the other ones or sold them off to other people. And at the time, I was running the Albany store. And this gentleman, Norm, he made me president the first year that he bought the company. and I went out of the stores and started working in the office and doing the buy-in. Uh, we had four stores at the time. We had one in Valley River, one downtown Eugene, one in Corvallis, one in Albany. Um, over the next three years, we bought a store in Bend and a store in Salem, and we opened three locations in Anchorage, Alaska. Oh, wow. So we were up to nine stores, and in 1988, we were at NARM meetings in Florida. NARM is the National Organization of Record Merchandisers. And Musicland had just gone public. Musicland, the mall stores, yes. And they really wanted the stores in Anchorage, Alaska, and two or three of the ones in the valley and didn't want all of them. And we said, you know, NARM said, well, I don't want to sell them, we're doing great. And I said, this is exactly why you should sell them. It's because you're at the top of your game right now, you're going to get top dollar for them, but don't let them just take the best stores, make them buy them all. And he's like, well, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm like 32 now, you know, I'm getting old. I said, I can't be selling rock and roll in my 30s and when I'm in my 40s and stuff like that. And he says, I'll just get, I'll go Famous find a real words. job. Yeah. So anyway, long story short, we sold him. Musicland wanted me to go to work for him. <laughs> and uh, they flew me to their headquarters in Minneapolis. I walked in office. And the reception area, there's a big sign that says, Friday's casual day. <laughs> well, me being in the record business, I didn't know what the hell casual day meant, you know? <laughs> and I said, what is casual day? And she said, receptionist said, oh, we get to wear jeans. It's like, I sort of knew right then and there I wasn't going to go to work for this company, you One know? One day of jeans a week is I not don't, for you, I yeah. don't own anything but jeans. <laughs> I don't own anything but promo t-shirts. I don't own a tie. I'm 62 years old, still don't know how to tie a tie. <laughs> I sat in Jack Euster's office. Jack Euster was the CEO of Musicland at the time. And I sat in his freaking huge 1,200 square foot office, you know, in my jeans and t-shirt. And um, he looked me right in the eye and he said, we're not in the music business, we're in commodities. So we'll sell anything that we can make a buck for. Well, that would have turned me off, right? I was immediately turned off, yeah. 
Yeah. So when I flew back from Minneapolis to Portland, a guy picked me up who was the East Coast, the West Coast uh, general manager of all the stores. He picked me up at the airport and we were going to drive down to the Salem store because we were going to start looking at the stores because the takeover was going to happen soon. We had to do inventories and get all the final pricing done and stuff like that. We didn't get along really well because as soon as I got in the car, I said, so where did you start? What record store did you start at? He said, oh, I, I have an MBA in business. I never worked in a record store. I said, well, I don't care if you have a master's degree in business. If you never worked in a record store, how do you the hell do you know what you're doing? Yeah. And he said, oh, I have a master's in business. And I, 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 and I said, doesn't answer I, my question. I said, whatever. I said, so my next question was, how long is it going to take me to get your job? <laughs> oh, he didn't like that at all. So needless to say, it was sort of a long drive to Salem. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I knew way before that I wasn't going to work, work for these people. I don't want to work in the corporate world, period. You've always struck me as an indie-minded guy. Yeah, I just don't want to, you know, I don't like people telling me what to do. I mean, we already have way too many rules and regulations. But anyway, you know, six months later, half the stores that we sold them closed because they just ruined them and people stopped going in there. And um, I was approached by two guys a tax attorney out of San Francisco and a stockbroker out of uh, Denver. At the time, these two guys owned Kazel. When oh, really? Kazel was right down here on West 11th. And they said, we want to open a CD only store and we have heard you have a great history and blah 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 and we want to pick your brain about it and stuff. So they flew out here and they took me and wine and dined me for a couple days and I wrote up this five year business plan and everything to do this and we were going to be partners and we were going to franchise these out for CD only stores on the west coast you know and we were going to have numerous locations well month goes by two months goes by I'm building the racks in my garage um, <laughs> come to find out these guys have no money whatsoever and they just lost the radio station because of non-payment and the oh. old owner took it back so I'm sort of at a standstill and I think, okay, I'm screwed now because I don't have any money. I could go out and get a bank loan, but I don't really have any history. Of... So anyway, I talked to the guy who used to own the Everybody's that I'm, that he, we just sold the company six right. months earlier. And I sat down and I just said, Norm, I said, I have no idea what I'm going to do. And he said, well, what do you need? And I said, I need X amount of dollars. And he said, okay, come by uh, next, next Tuesday, I'll have a check for you. I'm not going to tell you what he gave me, but he said, I want it back in four years. I'm not charging you any interest, and I don't want monthly payments. I just want it all repaid in four years. We paid him back in two and a half years. Okay. That's my favorite part of the story. Is yeah. <laughs> You've told me the story before. Yeah, uh, my, he, we paid him back in two and a half years. And still to this day, 30 years later, he walks in here and goes, oh, I need this, and I need this, and I need this, and he just takes it. And it's just like, what am I supposed to do? It's like, exactly. I, it's, it, you know, he's, uh, I'm indebted to him forever. You that, know? That's his interest on the loan. Isn't yes, it? that's his interest Records on the loan, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's just, just a great guy. He's, he's just a great guy, and he really did everything possible for me. All, of course, on the other hand, I made him a ton of money also <laughs> uh, when we sold the stores. So we opened down the street. March 27th, 1989, in the KZL building on the bottom floor. And I was there for three years, and then we moved here in June of 92. And then in July of 2003, we knocked out all the walls down below, took over a whole other space, took over this whole upstairs where we're at now. There used to be a, a travel agency here. Oh. And they backdoored it one night, and they just moved out. They hadn't paid rent in like three months, three months or something, and they moved out one night. And I didn't realize that. I contacted the landlord, and I said, did you know that these people moved out? And they said, no, but that doesn't surprise us. They haven't paid rent in three months. And I said, well, I want the space. And they said, really? And I said, yeah. I'll tell you what I want to do. You pay for the remodel, I'll sign a 10-year lease. And so they agreed, and, and here we sit. But that's sort of the story of how CD World got started, and then of course we added Skip's Records on to CD World about eight, nine years ago because so many people didn't know we carried vinyl Well, we added vinyl <laughs> back in. For the first probably 18 years, we were strictly CDs and, you know, lifestyle stuff, posters and t-shirts and cards, and, you know. I mean, one thing I know a lot of people don't know is I've built every single rack that's in this store. Did you really? Yep. 
I think I heard. I think I did hear you say that. I just forgot yeah. about it. I've built the new release walls. I've built the racks. I've built the counters. I've built everything in this store, in my little two-car garage. And I'm still building stuff. I mean, I just got done building. We're getting all new genre signs, and I had to rip a bunch of boards. Oh. We're getting all new genre signs getting put up. They're actually getting put up, starting to get put up today. Um, and I just got done building a bunch of cassette racks, and the cassettes are coming here. People are killing me because they want cassettes, and we've sort of just been hoarding them over the past two years, and so we have an inventory of like three or four thousand when we put them out, wow. and so and that's coming real soon, probably the, within the next week or two. Yeah, I've, so. I've started buying more vinyl, but I'm going to let other people have the cassettes. I, yeah. I have nothing but bad memories of cassettes. <laughs> it's it's you know if they're coming back, if there's a format that I can sell, some people love them. Yeah, yeah, if it's a format that I can sell, I'll sell it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Um, Record stores, as we all know, have uh, really unfortunately become a bit of a scarcity in recent years, like the last 10, 15 years particularly. What do you think has kept you around for so long while so many of the other businesses have gone under? Well, that's a good question. And if I had an answer, I could probably package it and sell it. But um, I think a lot of our success is not only the community that we're in, this is a great community. I mean, Eugene is a very, very, very diverse place to live. Um, it's a very unusual place to live. Mm -hmm. It attracts a lot of people around here. It's great having the university here. Um, but I'm going to say at least 90% of my success is my employees. I have some of the best people that have worked for me and some people that have worked for me and gone on to be doctors, or gone on to be attorneys, or gone on to do this and have great really? successes, and they come back and they say, this is still by far the best job I've ever had. Wow, I yeah. had no idea about that. Yes, there's. Oh, I got a kid that worked for me that he came in, who was a junior or a sophomore at Churchill, and every freaking three days he would come in. <laughs> I dropped a resume here. I really want a job. I dropped a resume here. I really want a job. When are you going to hire me? I got so sick of seeing him, I finally just said, Shit, Pat, show up at 9 o'clock on Monday and you'll start. <laughs> he worked for me for like 10 years or 11 years. Went through um, high school, went through college, went through medical school. He's a doctor's assistant now in Portland and still advancing himself. And we still talk all the We still communicate. I think he might have been the one that, uh, I have a friend who lives, in, lives down in San Diego. He was up here visiting, we were in the store, and he was looking for, it was probably Bossa Nova, because he's a big Bossa Nova fan, uh -huh. and uh, he was talking to one of your clerks, and he came out of, out of the store with a CD that he had recommended, yeah. and it's still one of his favorites to yeah. this day. So yeah. it, like, it probably was Pat, yeah. Pat's a great kid, and um, I mean, we've had people that, you know, Mike Scheip, the lead singer of Yaw worked here for like two years oh, really? and helped me build up my metal section. Yeah, I have a girl that used to work for me, God, I'm going to say 22, 23 years ago, that is now a very famous producer in Nashville. Really? Yeah. There's a guy named Bill Borndeck that owns the studio there that is world famous. And um, she wanted to go and learn from him. and. She helped me build my bluegrass and folk section. Thank you, Kim Baum, you're a sweetheart. And she still comes and visits me. That is whenever she's on the West Coast, you know. That and it's so just cool. little things like that that no one ever sees, but are very dear to my heart. And and, and these people mean so much to me, you know. And the store means a lot to them. Yeah. Yeah. That, and the store means a lot to me. Otherwise, I wouldn't get here at five o'clock in the morning, you know. <laughs> but um. They're all music junkies too, you know. It's like this is probably the the store with the most knowledgeable employees I've ever. Uh, well, been. not only that, but such a wide spectrum of knowledge too, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, we got the infamous Ian. Everybody loves the Ian and, ska and, expert. and his punk and his <laughs> ska and stuff. Yeah, <laughs> they're all good people. Ryan's a great guy. April's it was a super find. She walked into our lives three years ago, three and a half years ago. And she's just amazing. Uh, we got a new girl, Cece, who is just great. A uh, new kid named Elijah, who's been a customer that we sort of forced to work here. Now, don't get me wrong, not all my employees have been perfect. There's a few of them that I wish they were in jail. But 90% of them have been great. 
and like I said, so many of them I still stay in contact with, but it was really about them. Did but I mean, as far as the success goes, you know, I mean, my employees, number one, the community, also number one, you know. Um, so many people come in here that know us by first name, and we know them by first name. Mm -hmm. If we don't know them by first name, at least we know that, you know, it's the guy that's always in the metal section, you know, the one with the ponytail, you know, or the one with the studs here or something like that, you know. I mean, we all know what who we're talking about and stuff. Next question, cities the size of Eugene seldom have more than one record store, and if any at all, but, you know, Eugene has three, Portland has a disproportionate number compared to other cities. To Port Portland has like 20 some. Yeah. It's ridiculous. So what do you yeah. think it is about, you know, the Northwest or Oregon in particular? That I don't know. You know, I, I, it, to be honest with you, I've never been in the new store downtown, the, the Moon Rocks. I've heard it's a cool little store and, and it's sort of a, a very niche store and that's great. And I'm glad that she's making it just because I'm glad any record store still makes it these days. Yeah. And the people at House of Records are great. You know, we call back and forth, do you have this, do you have that? You know, we have nothing against House of Records whatsoever. I hope they stick around forever. And they've been here for 45 years. Yeah, and it's like I've you been know? in, you know, in, I go there all the time. Yeah, you know, oh yeah. It's like I've heard, you know, you recommend them and I've heard them recommend yeah. you. And it's like. Yeah, it's just good that we can work together, yeah. you know. Um, yeah, of course we're in competition and I'd rather have all their customers, but that's not the way life goes and I'm not going to win them all and there's some people that will not shop there and will only shop here and there's some people that will not shop here and only shop there and that's you know that's every anybody's prerogative um, it's just it, it it's unusual to have real two really really solid record stores in a town the size of Eugene which is not very big you know I mean Boise has two record stores and it's three million people I guess I didn't realize Boise was that big. It's it's growing like crazy. Wow. It's one of the fastest growing cities in the United States. <laughs> they had six Hastings over there. That's how many Hastings locations were in Boise. Wow. And of course, when Hastings closed, they all closed. So, <laughs> you know, the one record store over there, the one big record store over there, Record Exchange, is doing great. Another thing that has helped us is in-store performances. Mm -hmm. You know, you never see in-store performance. You never saw in-store performances at Musicland or at Camelot or at any of those places. <laughs> you know, we've had 600, 700 people packed in this store. That's a lot. Uh, we had an in-store just recently that no one knew, but the artist got a death threat before he came on social media. And we had to have private security that no one knew was here. My employees knew. The band, the band knew, the management knew, but the customers. None of the customers did, and we kept it quiet the whole time, and everything was fine. Do you want to that wasn't a freaking nerve-wracking day. Oh, yeah. Do you not want to divulge who who the artist was? It was the last big in-store we had that um, I don't know, but how, but they found me. Really? Yeah. They had a death threat. Yeah. One of the guys. I mean, we're talking three hundred and fifty. 13 to 18 year old girls screaming girls here and this was the guy that made the threat and so it wasn't that hard because there was only three boys here to watch that <laughs> entire instrument other than the dads that brought their teenage girls uh, it was the only instrument i had that started at 5 30 in the afternoon and i had 13 people waiting to open when i opened at nine o'clock to get in so they could be right in front of the stage they stayed in the store all day in all day long <laughs> <laughs> I put them to work moving stuff around because we have to move stuff to get ready for those instruments and stuff. You know, <laughs> those guys were absolutely amazing too. It, super sweet guys, and <laughs> and and they did a great set and stayed and signed everything for everybody and was very accommodating. We've had artists that are complete assholes when they show up, and it's just like, you know, you're doing this for free. Why did you even agree to do it if you're going to be a jerk? Um, <laughs> Michelle shocked. Played, did in store three times and it was great two of them and the third one she came in and she played and we had like kids sitting around on beanbag chairs and stuff and she came in she did one song she was halfway through the second song she threw her guitar down in the case and said this is the most boringest people I've ever met and walked out and then stood outside and for an hour and talked to her fans and signed stuff so needless to say she's not coming back but 
Well, there you have part one of my interview with Skip Hermans. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for watching, and an especially big thank you to Skip himself for taking the time to make this possible. Please stick around for part two, coming up in just a couple of days, in which Skip talks about the innovative and philanthropic spin he puts on Record Store Day every year, the various other charitable and community outreach events he's established through the store, some of which have spread across the country, as well as a very special remembrance of a significant member of the store's family and the lasting impact he made on the store and the men behind it. That's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it, and I appreciate the feedback, whether about this video or anything on my channel, or about music in general. I'd love to hear from you in the comments section below. I invite you to subscribe to my channel as well, and check out my past videos to see what you might have missed. I'm also on Twitter, and you can find the link to my Twitter feed in the description below, so check it out and follow along. Also, please take the time to visit my friends and fellow YouTubers' channels, which are also linked to in the description below. They're all great at what they do, and they're very much worth your attention. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time, and remember, life's too short to be a music snob.